joining me on stage now, I have Ninian Wilson, who is the Global Supply Chain Director and CEO of the Vodafone Procurement Company. We have Kenny Graham, CEO of Tomorrow Street, um, and Paresh Modi, Group Head of Business Development and Innovation at Vodafone. And we're joined by Chris Howarth, who is MD and Global Account Lead for Vodafone at Accenture. So a group of fantastic people to help me kick off our discussion today on how Vodafone is driving collaboration across the value chain. So welcome all, it's great to have you, but I know that we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm going to leap right into it. And I guess it's always good to start with a little bit of context, which Ninian, maybe you can help me with. I know that Vodafone is on a pretty big value creation transformation where you're wanting to evolve your positioning from being just a telecoms company, just a telecoms company, all the way through to becoming a tech comms platform. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about this? Yeah, no problem. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And it's uh, uh, great to have the opportunity to chat to you uh, from inside the house when it's beautiful sunshine outside and we haven't seen any for months. So just thought I'd get that out there straight away. Catalin, it's a great question. Uh, the truth is our industry is changing. So if you think of our ecosystem today, what a number of our partners or suppliers have done is they've created standard products, whether that's a Nokia, a Cisco or an Ericsson. And then they've gone around all of the operators and said, we've got this great product and you can have it for a million bucks. And they've sold very similar products to all of us. Our job as a telecommunications company back then was really to take these products bundle them into commercial offers and then try and sell them to either yourself or to other businesses. But because all the telcos were getting the same input from their partners, a lot of those offerings were very undifferentiated because we were all buying the same things from the same ecosystem. So therefore us as a company, you either continue doing that and you just have a race on price or you actually say, hold on a minute, is there a way we can change this model to create better differentiation for our customers, and then hopefully to differentiate Vodafone as a tech comms company from traditional telcos. And that's the journey we started nearly three years ago under our new chief executive officer, Nick Reed, And it's one which he continues on a drumbeat basis every single day uh, with us. Brilliant. It sounds like it must be something really fascinating. And I guess although three years can sound quite long, you're really still only at the beginning of it. And again, as we heard from Mark Engel, it is a journey. Um, but then, Kenny, how do you and how does Tomorrow Street support this transformation for Vodafone? Yeah, hi, Caitlin. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so listen, our, our main goal uh, as Tomorrow Street is to be a, a scale-up accelerator. So what we're doing and helping on that journey is we're out there hunting, you know, really exciting young companies that can support Vodafone uh, and the opportunity to differentiate uh, what we, how we serve the customer, what we offer uh, to Vodafone customers. So it's really about finding some great tech that either we can bring direct to, to customers or in fact great tech that can fit within Vodafone's digital estate, network estate, or wider sort of product estate that, that goes out to, to customers. So I would say I'm really lucky because when I, as I came into Tomorrow Street a year and a half ago, Vodafone was going through that journey, which meant the lens that we have as Tomorrow Street, the different technologies we can look at is much wider now, which makes it, it really, really exciting. Brilliant. Um, it is. It, 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 I kind of just want to sink my teeth in it. But then, of course, Paresh, you've also got your role where you're sitting sort of really internally within Vodafone. So how are you absorbing the innovation that comes from Tomorrow Street and supporting this overall transformation too? Uh, yeah, well, right. well, firstly, great to be here uh, and really uh, appreciate the invite to be able to talk about our innovation efforts along uh, along with all the others so so thanks to visible for that um so caitlin i think it's a uh you know as nina described this transformation is really it's it's really ambitious and non-trivial so uh, as we go into our next phase which is next generation next generation telco uh we're gonna have to work out how do we as an organization 
gear ourselves to deliver against those objectives, which means do we have the right people and skills? Uh, do we have the right setup, the technology? Do we have the right ambition levels? And, and are we organized in a way that we can make these things work? So those are all very fundamental questions for the organization. Uh, the bit that um, I, I, the, the part that I play in this is identifying those gaps that we have at the moment um, that, that don't, uh, where, where our supply chain or our existing partners or vendors or uh, suppliers are not exa exactly delivering to the disruptive agenda that we need to go down. Mm -hmm. That's where I kind of come in. So I'll work with Kenny, with his companies, or with the wider set of uh, uh, the ecosystem players out there, whether they're early stage, mid stage, or late stage, to identify what are the areas of disruption that are that we need to be uh, riding on the back of. Uh, so a big part of my role, as you say, it is actually internal, and I'm actually really proud of that. A uh, mm -hmm. big part of my role is going around talking to the people who are making decisions, uh, who have budget, who have roadmaps, who have objectives to achieve. Uh, but, you know, in light of the next generation telco, we've got to accelerate at a pace, creating real differentiation and delivering real value to our customers. And that's where, uh, you know, the, from the feedback we get internally from the decision makers, we go out to the startup ecosystem, we identify exactly the companies that can deliver value, and then we pair those up, match them up, and create an environment actually in, in, with Ninian and Kenny's help around the procurement side, uh, as well as a few other things, to really give ourselves an opportunity to create collaborative experiences and brilliant products and services. Brilliant. So the picture I'm getting is, Kenny, where you're focusing quite specifically on scale ups and being able to absorb the, the work that's being done there. Paresh, you're kind of looking at a fuller suite or potentially some of the smaller early stage startups. But then we have Chris, who's part of Accenture, which is very much not a startup. <laughs> what, what support and role is it that you play and Accenture plays in supporting Vodafone on this journey? Uh, thanks, Caitlin. And, and again, thanks for uh, for inviting us along. Um, as part of our work with Tomorrow Street, uh, with Kenny, we obviously work alongside Visible. So uh, uh, thanks very much for the invite today. Um, I think, yeah, the, the role of, of partners like Accenture and, and obviously Vodafone has some great strategic partnerships with, with others too, is, is critical in achieving the strategy. And I think Vodafone have realized this for some time. And, and actually when, when they launch the kind of like the, the, something like the tech code strategy now, they spend a significant amount of time actually with us as partners explaining that strategy. And I think that's really key because if, if we don't fully buy into the strategy, then then we can also be a blocker and, and not an enabler in that. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and also, I think we're always very upfront about the strategy as well, because it's easy to buy into a strategy when it works with yours as a company. But actually, um, we're, but actually, the, the tech co-vision, while many elements of it we think we can help Vodafone with, some of it is, is effectively competitive to our strategy of building some of the skills that Vodafone are going to build uh, as a as a software engineering kind of uh, group in Europe is, is are the kind of skills we're trying to build and sell to our clients. But understanding it early, really engaging on the topic, but then my job is really making sure that my team really, really commit to that strategy. Mm -hmm. If we just pay lip service, then we know from experience in the long term, that's not gonna work and we will not be a strategic partner with, with, uh, with Vodafone, we'll end up being just another supplier. And so I think that sharing of the strategy, having a really clear vision, the depth of which Vodafone share it across all areas of the business, technology, business, uh, in procurement, finance, is really key. And it's a very universal strategy. So it's very easy to understand. We have to absorb it, digest it, and see how we help Vodafone. That's fantastic. Thank you. And, you know, I think it's um, the idea that we were getting from the earlier conversation with Mark Engel is, you know, the sheer scale of an organization like a Unilever, um, where there are so many different elements at play. And now talking to you guys, you're kind of 
providing the perfect example of it again, where there are all of these different arms of Vodafone that have to come together to make something happen. And you, you have to get that alignment, not just within your organization, but within your ecosystem and, of course, with all of your sort of strategic suppliers. Ninian, what role do you play in making sure that that messaging is consistent and also ensuring that, as Chris was saying, you know, you, you're able to engage in a little bit of healthy cooperation, potentially, because you're so aligned but might also be wanting to offer competing services with the very people that you're partnering with? Thank you. I was I was just looking at the screen and I was I was thinking Paresh's speech mark. If that was at the front of the conversation, and ours was at the back, it's kind of how it works, right? Because Paresh is <laughs> yeah. helping you right at the front end of the business, and mm -hmm. we're helping at the back end as well as uh, in Kenny's and Tomorrow Street. So, I think first of all, the choreography of strategic relationships is one: it's difficult. Uh, two: mm -hmm. it's more difficult if you're multi-country and multi-culture. But really, our job is really to help the business join up the thinking between suppliers and partners. And a really good example of that is the work we've been doing with Accenture, where we've helped and supported the business in creating joint product offerings and go to market. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are in the fortunate position, uh, which not all companies are in, that we've got one single ERP system. We've got one single version of the truth. And it really helps when someone says, oh, we're spending far too much with Accenture, that at least we know how much too much for spending with Accenture. <laughs> so there's a little bit of choreography there. There's a little bit of joining up between the CTO community, who are the people yeah. who do some of the choices around new vendors for, for product. And obviously working very collaboratively, uh, that word, in a collaborative <laughs> way with Paresh's team, who are more at sort of the front end, thinking, right, where are the gaps? What should we be looking for? And then Kenny's team saying, right, we will help go look. So I think it, it, it's kind of working. Uh, mm. To Mark's point, it's not perfect. Does it work all the time? No, it doesn't. Is it beginning to work more than it used to? Yes, it does. Is there still more to do? Yes, there is. In an operating company with you know 25 operating companies from here, you know, right down to sub-Saharan Africa, there's always going to be people doing slightly different things. Mm. And in a way, that's the power of the group mm. because you can see different innovation but also it's one of the challenges we have around picking winners. And, and Paresh mm. is actually involved in helping pick winners and what are the big bets we want to make of the, you know, the hundreds of small innovations which we, we run every month or every quarter. Mm. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe I can jump in and build on that, Caitlin. Um, I think that the, um, our partners are going to be really critical in this, uh, this whole journey to tech comms um, because we absolutely now are starting to realize, you know, after many years of not realizing this, over the last few years, start to realize that we can't do it by ourselves. It's something we should have realized a lot earlier, but now we are really much more open as an organization to bringing partnerships forward. It doesn't matter whether we compete or not. Of course, we've got to be careful as to where the lines of demarcation are. The more important thing is, how do you grow the size of the pie in order that you can have bigger slices of the pie as opposed to how can you compete with each other? And unless um, you have open minds towards partners and unless uh, partners have open minds towards us, uh, you know, whether they're small partners like startups or large partners like Accenture, uh, we're not going to succeed in delivering everything that we want to do. We're just not going to get there. And so this piece is really critical. Absolutely. What you're both describing to me, I think is this openness to exploring kind of different um, styles of relationship potentially and, and different business models between yourselves and your partners where it's not simply buyer seller. But one of the questions that we have that's come up in the chat is also around business models, but I guess more externally facing, which is how does Vodafone's business model change when you're transforming yourself into a tech company or does it at all? Um, Ninian, I'd love to hear your perspective on this and also yours, Kenny. Yeah, let me kick off a little bit and just think about the different commercial models 
which we're putting together now, and, and maybe Chris can comment this one as well. We started a journey with Accenture on developing a joint go-to-market product, and it was a phone call mm. from Chris to me or somebody. We're all claiming it because it's quite successful. So we can't quite remember <laughs> who started the discussion, but it's definitely Chris on the Accenture side said, listen, we bought this company, we kind of don't know what to do with it, and we'd really like to partner, to, to paraphrase a little bit, Chris. Uh, and we had a, a really good chief executive to chief executive meeting uh, with uh, Chris's CEO. And at the end of the meeting, I remember she said, uh, whatever you do, don't let procurement get involved in this, yeah? Yeah? And you think, and I was on the call, and I was thinking, my goodness, how do I deal with this, right? <laughs> Apart from resign, you know, because clearly the <laughs> reputation is that bad. But what, what she meant, I think, was don't just put this relationship through a standard procurement process because it will take far too long and we'll lose the value opportunity between the two companies. So actually procurement with the business put a whole new commercial model, gain share model together with Accenture where we're now jointly going to market. We share the investment, we share the reward and we share the gain and we did not go to tender. And, you know, we came at the end and, you know, Chris's CEO was very appreciative until she found out we were from procurement, so she didn't quite get that piece. But but I think it's a subtle change, but it's quite a big change because a lot of procurement people's DNA is take the idea, commoditize it, reduce the price, right? And if you do that standard way of procurement, you miss the market. And if you miss the market, you miss the opportunity. And I think to Parish's point around the ecosystem is entirely changing now in telecommunications. We used to just go to say Ericsson and say, give me an SMS platform, thank you. Now it's various partners, various ecosystems and different commercial models. I don't know, Chris, if you wanted to comment quickly on, on that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think uh, you summarized def very well the, the the one business we've already launched. And, I, and it genuinely is, we are now in business together, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's still within the, the constructs of what looks like fairly normal kind of arrangements, but it's a business and we are, we are scaling and launching a business together. And there's a second idea that we're currently working through. And interestingly now, we know it's not a serious idea until we've actually got to that stage and got your team involved, Million. And we've got the, because it's very, it is a commercial team, not a procurement team. And, and so uh, I think the, the success we've seen has been as a result of showing that we can rapidly go from really good idea, um, wh whoever really had it, um, and uh, to to launch within months, because otherwise yeah. people just lose interest, right? And so we've proved we can do it on one idea, and and therefore, actually, ecosystem partners as well as Vodafone are approaching us on a, on on other areas because if we could replicate that in two or three areas, right, you've got you've got several businesses to be betting on. So yeah, we I think you know a lot, we foresee a future where large amounts of our of our business with Vodafone will be in very different models than the traditional kind of supplier buyer type model. Mm -hmm. And of course, Kenny, your whole role is to really nurture relationships, albeit more with scale ups, but there isn't really that buyer seller dynamic evident at all with Tomorrow Street, is there? Well, let, well, let me sort of talk about the model. A little mm. bit it's really important and i think it's key to the success that we're starting to see i've been in many innovation teams over my couple of years uh career and, and a lot of innovation teams um you know how you play and how you're measured it's it's uh it, it, it's not always as clear as maybe it could be. and i think the big thing with tomorrow street is we've got really clear targets really clear kpis which really drives the whole team to, to make sure that companies we partner with are successful we're measured on how successful you know, we can help those companies be, you know, respecting all the processes that exist in the company. When you take the, the, the sort of commercial opportunity, the business opportunity that Ninian and Chris were just talking about, you know, what we saw was an opportunity for one of our partners to play, you know, because we're hungry to help them be successful. So we saw what was being built there and we were able to position one of our companies into that new proposition, which means everyone's winning, right? So Vodafone's yeah. customers, get the end result, essentially winning, Vodafone winning, and our scale-ups get the chance to win out of that as well. So, uh, you know, it all gels together nice, and it's all about, it's all the collaboration. It's trying to find those opportunities where, you know, everyone can, uh, you know, get get a get a good outcome from it. 
Mm. You're um, describing what Anoop, who I know is watching this conversation, would talk about as the triple win, where your consumers win, company wins, and the partners or suppliers do. And it's just a fantastic and succinct way to wrap it up, isn't it? But let's go to the day-to-day -day then and how that actually looks. So, Ninian, you, you did a great job of sort of saying how it started with a phone call, you know, where Chris was saying, we have this opportunity, we think you know it, it would be really interesting hey are you interested how do you then broker communication and collaboration between all the different parties when it's with tomorrow street and the scale-ups that you've identified how do you get that communication right um ninian maybe you could take that question yeah i thought we'd agreed that the difficult questions went to someone else before this sort of thing. that was kind of agreed right so Hello, <laughs> I think there's a there, there's a couple of things, and and again, I, you know, have we completely systematized what we do? I wouldn't say we were there yet. I don't think we've quite got a single model that works. Uh, and I think a lot, even in big companies, relies on people like Paresh, his connections in the business, my connections in the business, Kenny's connections in the business, uh, and to create a level of excitement jointly around something to see if it will fly. Uh, and if I look back at the Accenture relationship and that security proposition, which we now have live in the market, we, we, we sort of stole a little bit from Amazon's way of writing the press release in detail, you know, so we, we scoped out what it would be. And so we also had a Q&A, so how would it work, et cetera. So you try and vision where you're going to be in sort of a year's time or two years time with the press release. And that kind of caught the imagination of some of the senior execs in the business. And then once we got that and the CEO support, then it began to move very quickly. I, I think the piece which is always frustrating is when you can see it's a great idea, but why does nobody else see it, right? And, and that's probably because you're not pitching it in the right way internally to your colleagues, or they've got a list of 500 other things that are sort of on the priority list. So there's a little bit of human connection, collaboration across the business. There's probably a little bit more in process we need to do. And I hear people often say, oh, you need to be a little bit more like Amazon or a little bit more like Google. Well, that's not correct because what works for them may not necessarily work in our culture and our way of working. We just need to be a little bit more like Vodafone and be more innovative and entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's quite a big challenge for us culturally. Yeah. I think Paresh touched upon it because you expect your telecoms network to work all the time, 24-7, right quality, right bandwidth. So our culture has been a non-failure culture because our yeah. customers expect everything to work all the time. So that learning culture around, oh, it didn't work, don't worry, move on to the next thing, isn't quite there in our business because it's a it mustn't fail culture. So these are some of the cultural steps we also have to make to try and move the company to be a little bit more comfortable with not succeeding. And the way I've just said that, you can probably tell that we don't even use the word failure very often in Vodafone, <laughs> not succeeding. So that we didn't quite succeed on that one. It didn't quite mm -hmm. go the way. We don't, we don't quite say, oh, it failed. Don't worry about it. Turn it off and move on to the next one. So that mm -hmm. there's a whole recipe here. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I still think, you know, we're probably baking the odd cake, but, it, you know, they're not quite as tasty as we'd like them to be yet. So there's more experimentation for us to go, I think, on that recipe. Yeah, yeah. And on that point around culture, fear of failure, and I know Paresh, you and I have spoken about creating psychological safety for innovation before, but how have you seen the startups that you're working with play a really fundamental role in helping Vodafone to adopt yeah, a little bit more of an experimental culture? Uh, it's a it's a really great uh, question, and and they really do actually. Um, they give you a shot of the arm when you meet some of them. Um, you kind of go, oh, "What am I doing? I'm not. Why am I talking like the way I am? And why am I not talking like the way that person is? Uh, or why am I not thinking in the same way? Or why am I not thinking out of the box? Uh, you know, like this morning I had a conversation with HR about can I convert. Uh, an industrial placement student into a permanent head, cost would be exactly the same? And the answer was no, um, unless it went up to the one of the Exco members to sign off to give me an extra headcount. 
mm. exactly the same cost exactly you know so so you know i kind of asked i stood back because i've just had a meeting with the startup literally the meeting before and i just said we need to listen to ourselves a little bit uh, as to why we are behaving like this why do we have this mindset of no it's really hard to do as opposed to that makes complete sense it's the same cost set much much better effect um and it's going to create better outcomes for our customers so we should just do that uh, and that's just one small example from today uh, but it, it generally uh when we connect startups with people in the business and some of these people are let's say it's a product manager that's been in that job for 10 years they really understand their stuff says that person is there to make sure that the product can be rolled out uh, to 50 million customers and it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the that's that person's mindset. But they're the ones that the ex uh, that they are the expert in that particular area in the whole company. So the question is, do you try and find somebody new to do that job with a different mindset, or do you partner them and pair them up with amazing, cool, innovative players who? are thinking differently and get them to work together collaboratively because guess what they're both going to get something out of it mm. uh, and, and the answer is of course the latter and we find again and, and again and again every time we do that our mindset changes we create better outcomes we have people that are more willing to be open and collaborative and create amazing uh, new products and services on the back of that mm. Brilliant. Um, and Kenny, I guess same question for you, but how is it different with scale-ups? How are they helping Vodafone to embrace more of a failing fast mentality? Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing, how, how things are different with scale-ups is, is I think it's that, it's that hunger, right? Mm. Because, uh, you know, on if you take Vodafone in the past to do something different might take some time right it's a big organization you need to get everyone lined up there's a lot of people involved it can take time and it's time that maybe touching on some of the points that uh, Paresh made we've kind of got used to it right in the Vodafone world that it takes a bit of time but you partner with the scale up and you say we're going to be successful together you know they're going to be on your back every single week <laughs> have we made that connection yet have we got agreement on a business plan uh, and I tell you what, it really helps. It helps us as Tomorrow Street because we are now in that same frame of mind. And of course, when we go out to, to, into Vodafone or with our partners and say, look, we've got to really move in this. It, it stump, I'm feeling the pace really pick up across Vodafone. And it's not just what we are doing or what Paresh is doing. It's across the business now that, you know, there is this sense of change that's going on in Vodafone. And we're really lucky because we're, 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 we're sort of experiencing it early on but we're starting to see that pace really be injected right across the business. So uh, it's that pace, it's that hunger for success that, that, that you know, we learn from the scale-ups and is starting to, to, to bleed into the rest of the organization, which is really exciting. That's fantastic. And um, Kenny, I know you and I have spoken about this before in terms of when relationships don't work, but Ninian, and I'm going to steal your analogy of the cake. What happens when the cake doesn't rise? What happens when you embark on a potential opportunity with some suppliers and you realize it's not going to work out? It could even perhaps be that you just realize these are not the right people to go on the journey with you. What does that look like? Chris, maybe you can talk about it, not necessarily in specific relation to Vodafone, but I'm sure you have seen times where it's better to cut your losses and continue but how do you do that in a way that still preserves the relationship well i think i think one of the ways you do it you everyone's been mentioning this theme of time uh throughout and I, and I actually think uh is doing it fast is really really important right so uh and and i think if there's one big change i've seen in the last couple of years uh at vodafone in front of me i will use it as the example is is a willingness to make a decision try something but get to the result quicker because I, I've not seen uh, like a, a, a anyone being concerned with failure if it's done fast as opposed to just letting something drag out on and on and on or even worse not getting started I, I actually think there used to be more of a culture not for, not not uh, fast failure but actually uh, slow starting right so mm -hmm. I think the key is is announcing things fast and, and back to our security example 
we had to rush the last few days of getting the agreement signed because within days of signing the agreement, Nick announced it in the quarterly earnings call. Wow. Right? And, and the, the minute that's done, there's no turning back. It doesn't guarantee success. What it does guarantee is that we're going to go fast. Right? So I think, I think that's one of our uh, major learnings. And, and also just, and then ultimately seeing the bigger picture. Right, you can get very transfixed on one thing going wrong and, and lose sight of the broader partnership. Right, you've got to accept if you have a broad enough partnership, not, not every single thing will work, but try not to get transfixed with the one thing that goes wrong and let it uh, cause damage to everything. But, but accept it, accept your losses, and, and move on. Uh, the two things I would say there is a, a really compelling story for having that huge commitment to what it is that you're trying to do isn't it again when i was speaking to mark engel you know unilever are known for making very big commitments to their sustainability goals and that's not to say that there's not a lot of work going on in the background but he's been really open about saying it's because we kind of have to get everybody to commit to it and we can only do that when we kind of publicize it and we make it very clear that that's what we want to go for because if we don't do that up front then people feel like it'll be okay if we don't achieve it or don't get there. But I know that we need to start wrapping up and um, Ninian, I'm, I'm going to ask you to close by answering one of the questions that we had in the chat, which was, how would you describe the Vodafone ecosystem? Do you think it's equal parts, kind of large enterprises that you're partnering with and then startups or scale ups? Or do you have predominantly relationships with other enterprises and then a few smatterings of smaller organizations? What does it look like? I think there's there's probably two parts of that. There's what does it look like today and kind mm. of where's it going, right? I think if you look at it today, which will be very typical for a lot of telecommunications company, it will be very large relationships with very large partners. Nokia, Ericsson, Accenture, IBM, just to keep Chris on his toes, name another couple of competitors, right? So very large relationship. That's where it is today. But I do think it's changing. And it's changing because the way these this industry worked, which was pretty monolithic, buy it from Ericsson, it'll all be okay, is completely changing. So now there's the opportunity to work with smaller startups and smaller scale-ups. And I think over the next four or five years, you'll see the mix of spend beginning to change. I don't think it's changed materially yet, but I think it, it is changing. So I think that's changing. I'll leave you with a final quote, which I thought is a fantastic one from a great innovator, maybe or maybe not. Uh, and this quote was, uh, it's been parroted a couple of times, one by Peter Drucker, who mm -hmm. people of a certain age on this call will know Peter Drucker because they had to go through all of his thinking on business when they were sort of doing exams and sort of stuff. Uh, so Peter retweeted it, if you would. He didn't tweet it back then, but he reused it. But this is an original quote from Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't try and predict the future, create it. And I think with all the people around the table, whether it's Accenture, Paresh, or Kenny, then in Vodafone, we are trying to create the future, not predict it. So I think we're absolutely on a journey. We're 100% committed. The chief executives put it in writing. It's in everybody's objectives. We're changing the whole of our technology organization tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 17,000 people will have their reporting line changed. So we're really up for this change. And that's all part of us pivoting to the new and trying to move away from the legacy. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, Ninian, Paresh, Kenny. This has been fascinating to get a flavor for how things are working at Vodafone and how you're going along on this journey towards the ever-evolving ecosystem. As you said earlier, Ninian, the journey will never be over. <laughs> but I really appreciate the time that we've had together today. It's been hugely valuable. Thank you so much, everyone. We can sign off for now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you again.